You are about to listen to Upon the Rock broadcast with Pastor Lauren Shakir of Foundation of the World Church. It is our prayer that each teaching will help build a godly foundation in your life. Please be sure to visit the church website at thefoundedworld.org for further information about this ministry and to view more teachings. Now, here is today's message. I got a word, you all, today. I got a word. And uh, I'm excited about it because I actually thought I was supposed to be preaching on something else. And then when I come here and hear the prayers, I'm like, oh, Lord. It's the right thing. And today my teaching is called The Keys to the Kingdom. Keys to the Kingdom. Everybody say keys to the kingdom. Keys to the kingdom. Say it again. Say keys to the kingdom. Keys to the kingdom. Because we have this time of Resurrection Sunday. And thank God for Resurrection Sunday. Me and my wife, we wearing our chosen sweaters today. Comes out, season two comes out today. So y'all make sure y'all. Y'all support Christian businesses, so we want to represent. But, you know, the, this is Resurrection Day, and oftentimes, if we're not careful, we get into a certain rut of teaching a certain message. We've all been there, right? So y'all know me. If everybody's going one way, then mm, I think I'm going to try this new go over here. Not that I'm rebellious. It's just that I'm a little skeptical about broadways. So I will try to do the narrow path and make sure I'm in God's will. What did God say to you, right? Because I know what he's saying corporately, but there is an individual word. What is God saying to you? And so I got up this morning and I just thought, okay, I know what I'm supposed to say. And the Lord said, no. And it was a burden that kind of just sat on me. He says, tell my people that I've given them the keys to the kingdom. And we hear that, but we don't recognize what that is. So I attempt, through this teaching style and that you all appreciate with videos and pictures and everything that I have to show you the keys of the kingdom because I don't think we really got it. I think we know about the cross. We know about resurrection. We know about, you know, he rose on the third day. All that is great. But why did he come in the first place? To give us something. Because we lost something, right? Everybody say again, keys to the kingdom. All right, so I'm just going to go straight to the beginning, which is in the book of Isaiah chapter 14. Forgive me, I have a lot of scriptures. If y'all want to take notes, probably this is a good one to take notes on because I'm going to go pretty fast, but I'm not going to go so fast that you can't catch up. But look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14. Lucifer said, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high God. That's Lucifer. Talks about in Isaiah chapter 14. We all know that um, he was cast down from heaven, right? Because he said in his heart, I want to be like God. And so basically God blinked and just like lightning, he fell to the earth, right? Now I can go into all the parts of when, you know, people debate Satan, he, is he in hell? No, he's not in hell. He's on the earth. He's going to hell. But he hit the earth and all this chaotic stuff happened to the earth. And then the Bible talks about in Genesis chapter 1, um, in, in Genesis chapter 1, how he talks about how he made the earth and he made the land and he, he told the people to replenish the earth. In other words, something happened that caused a lot of death, a lot of things, and God said replenish, right? I'm not going to get into that. That's a footnote. But let's look at this real quick. So we know the story about, you know, Lucifer. He fell from heaven because he wanted to be like God. He had this chip on his shoulder and he says, you know what, I want my authority back. And so the Bible talks about that God made man in his image, right? In, Exodus, in Genesis chapter three, it talks about God made man in his image. In other words, he says, I want you to have dominion of the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and, and the, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that includes the creep, the devil. But notice how God made man the God of this world. Satan already said in his heart, I want to be like God. So he stripped of all of his rank and he looked at man and man has all this authority and, and man is the God of this world. Everything except for, you know, God's kingdom, man was over that. The first heaven, which is the, the atmosphere you see in the stars in the universe, all of that, the land, the water. That's why even animals still had the fear of man because we were created to have dominion. Everybody say dominion. dominion. 
I'm saying this a little bit too fast, I know, but I want you all to get why Jesus had to come. So, man has all this power. He told his wife, don't eat of the fruit of the tree. The day we eat it, we're going to die, right? Don't eat it. So Satan came, you all know in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, and Satan, the serpent said, You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You can pause right there. Satan's job is always to make you think that God is holding out on you. Twisting the word. Twisting the word so you don't have the abundant life that God wanted to give you from the beginning the abundant life was there they had no sin they had no problems there was no hurricanes there was no animals eating each other because everything was perfect right but satan came in and said no god is holding out on you you need to be like god and so man actually recognized oh i can't do this on my own i need a savior because everything was perfect and i still mess it up right so god already knew man's gonna mess up so he slain his son from the foundation of the world, the Bible says, right? And then time had to catch it to that word. Are y'all getting this so far? Yes. Okay, so he slain him in the spirit. And then God says, I know that man can never keep my, my word, my laws. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to speak my word into the atmosphere. I'm going to speak my word through laws. I'm going to speak my word through prophets. And he said, he kept speaking his word, right? Romans chapter 5, verse 14, Mark says, he says, Yet death ruled over mankind from Adam to Moses, from Adam to Moses, the lawgiver, even over those who had not sinned as Adam did. Adam is a type of him, Christ, who was to come, but in reverse, Adam brought destruction, Christ brought salvation. So in other words, Adam was like Christ. He was God's son, right? So he was a type of Christ that if he did it once, then everybody behind him has to have the same thing. So we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity because of what Adam did, not because we ate the fruit. So we have the sin nature that's about us. Every time we try to do right, here we go, falling again. Every time you get up, here he goes, knocking back down. Every time you take two steps forward, he knocks you three steps back. So it's like you got this sin nature that you can't make it on your own. You need a savior because on your best day, the Bible says your righteousness is a filthy rags. There's nothing you can do to get yourself to heaven because you're so good. Because I prayed enough. Because I went to church every Sunday. Because I did this. Because, you know, we get into these works. All of that is for your working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But it's not enough to get you into heaven. So I don't care how good you are. I don't care if you never taste liquor. You never cussed. You never slept around. You still will bust hell wide open. You will, because there's nothing you can do that's so great that God said, oh, come on in here, boy. Or come on in here, and girl. It's, not, it's nothing like that, right? You needed somebody who conquered that. So that's why he says right here in Galatians chapter 3, verse uh, 24, it says, so the law was our guardian until Christ came so that we might be justified through faith. I'm gonna just pause right there because when we read Galatians, sometimes it sounds so poetic that we just kind of miss over it. Here's what happened. Satan messed, I mean, Adam messed up. Death came and started ruling over everybody. And God says, it's too early for me to bring myself down there, so I need to speak my word. And he chose Moses. I need you to write the law. What am I writing the law for? I need some kind of guardian or schoolmaster to kind of keep people's minds straight until I get down there. So God, Moses wrote the law. He says, don't do this, don't do that. Why? Because it's reflecting God's character. Don't do this. And so people tried so hard to keep the law and they recognized they still couldn't keep the law. Now these are God's words. And God said, okay, it's okay, it's the law. And then he spoke to prophets and said, I want you to speak my word. I had Moses, you write the law. Now I need the prophets to speak the, the word of God, right? And so we look right here in Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. Am I going too fast for y'all? Y'all good? All right. I got to give you all these scriptures because I got to build your faith. Hosea chapter 13, verse 14 in the Amplified says, Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? That's the place of the dead. That's another way of saying the word hell. Shall I ransom them from the place of hell? Shall I redeem them from death? Oh, death, where is your thorn? Oh, grave or oh, shield, where is your sting? 
Compassion is hidden. I like this part. Compassion is hidden from my eyes because they of their failure to repent. Compassion is hidden from my eyes because of their failure to repent. So in other words, the unpardonable sin I was telling you all about, if you die without Christ, there is no remission of sin. You don't go to hell because you're a bad person. There's a lot of good people going to hell. You go to hell because you refuse to repent and to ask Jesus to come into your life. Right? And so God is saying through the prophets, I'm going to defeat death because the Bible said at this time, death was ruling over man. I love this teaching already. I'm sorry. FBI. Listen, death is ruling over man right now. And then God says, I can't stand that death is ruling because that is not what I created. So I'm going to defeat death. So he says, the prophecy, the prophet starts speaking, where death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? He starts speaking the word of God to the prophets and the law, right? So now God kept speaking the word, kept speaking the word, kept speaking the word. And more prophets come in and in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, we just quoted this, no weapon foreign against. In fact, we're going to do a little exercise real quick. You can keep it on that. In fact, put it on me for a second. We're going to do a little exercise. When I say the word you, I want you all to say out loud, he's talking about me. So when I say the word you, you say, he's talking about me. Y'all get it? All right. So go back to Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. Bible says in verse 17, no weapon foreign against you shall prosper and every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. I'm going to read that again. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. I'm going to try that one more time. Can we do it one more time? All right, now. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Now, did y'all get that? In other words, I had to say that because when we say you, we always think it's talking about God. See, that when we read this verse, we say, no weapon for and against you shall prosper, and every time it rises against you, you shall condemn, and you shall, you know. And we, we approach God as if it's like a, God, do this for me. Y'all hear what I'm saying? That's why our prayers is like, Lord, if it's your will, Lord, don't you see what's happening? Oh, Lord, stretch forth your hand. Come see about me. Stop by here. You know, all of these things. But this verse says, the weapons that are formed against you shall, pros shall not prosper. He's talking about the weapons that are formed against you. Not the ones, in other words, it's formed and it is against you but it's not going to prosper. Are y'all hearing me? Yes. So, that's all right if it's not working, just, we'll just do two cameras then. So, again, I'm gonna read that verse again in 17, it says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper and every time it rises against you, you shall condemn. Um, when you see a weapon and it's formed against you, number one, you ought to recognize God's given me a certain authority that even though it's formed against me, it will not prosper and you shall condemn. In other words, I shall condemn that. Why? Because the word of the Lord already condemned sin. The word of the Lord condemned everything that's not part of the abundant life. So when you pray to God, even though you have everything you need to have but abundant life, a lot of people are not using their authority when it talks about condemning things that are formed against you. See, what's formed against you may not be formed against me. So I can pray and intercede for you. But if you don't step up and condemn or rebuke or, you know, bind that enemy that's formed against you, then you're not living according to God's will. And I know that sounds hard, but look at this again. He says, this is the what? Heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me. God said, that's from me. Your heritage is for you to do this. And then it says, says the Lord. 
So in other words, God wasn't saying, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. God wasn't saying that. No, he said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you, you shall condemn it. Then God says, that's part of your heritage of the saints. You're supposed to tread upon the enemy. You don't know how much you've just been in line. You're supposed to walk on these things. And the Bible says that is your inheritance. So why is it that we don't use our inheritance? Why do we ask God, move this mountain, Lord? God is not your errand boy. He's given you authority. But we, we have been trained that, oh, Lord, if you're not too busy, please stop by here. Come see about me. <laughs> what? That's not the Bible. And my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. He just said the weapons. I know when you go through life, you're going to have weapons. They're going to be formed against you. But he says you take authority and you condemn it because that's part of your inheritance. And God says, and your righteousness is by me. You're not standing in your own authority. You're standing in my authority. But at that time, that was just a prophetic word. People didn't know what that meant. And so we had all of these things. And the Bible says through the law, he spoke the word through the law. Then through the prophets, he spoke the word through the prophets. He kept speaking through the law, through the prophets, through the law, through the prophets, through the law, through the law and the prophets. Tongue tied. Law, prophets, law, prophets. He kept saying the word, kept saying the word, kept saying the word. And the Bible said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? So now we saw what God has spoken is a living, breathing human being that walked around. So the word came and it's almost like God is saying, because he didn't have a son like how me and my wife had sons. He didn't have to have a particular act to produce a son. This is where the Islamic people miss it. Where is God's wife? How does he have a son? God is so powerful, he spoke the word. The word that came from him became flesh. That's his son. But you, don't have, you can't see that unless you have the Holy Spirit to recognize God is that power. He can speak the word and it actually formed somebody? Yes. The word became flesh through the law, through the prophets, through the law and the prophets. 42 generations, all of a sudden, that word that God spoke had lungs, had eyes, fingers, toes, and walked around for 33 years. The word of God walked around. So, John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it's almost like God had to like learn in a way. He's all knowing. But you know, Jesus had to learn how to talk. He had to learn how to walk. He had to, he had to be touched with every single infirmity just like us, yet without sin. So we can't say, oh, you're God. That's why I work for you. No, I came to live like a man. I came to live like one of you all. That's why I dwelt among you. I love this teaching, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this teaching. Listen, so the word became flesh. And then the Bible says right here in Matthew chapter uh, 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. So in other words, before this time, before Jesus showed up, people was trying everything they can to get inside the kingdom of God. They really couldn't do it. They were trying to follow the law. They were trying to listen to the prophets. And they just, they was doing the best they can. And they was taking it by force. You have to be, you have to be very radical. You have to be a Jeremiah, basically, to really just say, I got a real relationship with God. At that time, you need these super spiritual people to really have a, to be called a man of God. And the violent took it by force. All the passive people, or in this case, passive Christians, yeah, the lukewarm people, uh-uh. They wasn't getting in. They made enough sacrifices with goats and doves and all this, but they could not seem to get it right. Are y'all listening to me? Yes. So, from the days of John the Baptist until now, when John started preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is here, whole nother story, whole nother sermon. But basically, and I could feel faith in the room. Y'all are really learning this. Y'all are getting this, aren't you? So... When, when the Lord walked the earth, he put a paradigm shift into the ways of God's way. In other words, God has been showing you through the law and the prophets all of this time. Now you're going to see. He said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what he said, right? So when you see how Jesus responded to people, how he talked with them and the Bible says right here in Luke chapter 2 verse 52 and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and with favor with God and man 
So he wasn't so, you know, how we get these ideas about God, that God is so far above that he can't be touched with us. No, the Bible says he grew with stature with God and man. So he was a godly person, but he also was likable. He had good people skills. Now, that's not to knock anybody who has an um, introverted personality. It's just simply saying is that you can be godly and still love people at the same time. All the, two, all the laws and the prophets sum on two things, love God and love man. If you do these two, you fulfill all the law and all the prophets. So when Jesus came, he was the embodiment of loving God and loving man at the same time. So when you see him as an example, I'm flowing. Thank you, Lord. I can feel the anointing on this teaching. Listen, when you saw Jesus walking like that, that was the perfect example to say, that's the kind of Christian I'm supposed to be. He just came to give you a sample for 33 years and say, look what I'm doing. The Bible says right here in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, look how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good. Everybody say doing good. He was just doing good, right? Healing all those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Healing all of those who were under the power of the devil. In other words, they still got that snake in their ear. That's enough. They still got that snake in their ear and they just can't seem to get over this. They don't recognize that they have overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony because Satan is whispering condemnation in their ear. And so again, my people are short for a lack of knowledge. If they don't know the word or they haven't, they're not hanging around the word, they will be destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Is this making sense? Yeah. So that's why when Jesus went around, he didn't just go around healing people. The Bible said he went around doing good. He was just a good person. So he wasn't so deep. Oh, don't you touch me. He wasn't so deep that you can't touch him. He wasn't so deep and so out there and so religious that you got to come to him a certain way. No, he was a regular guy. And the Bible said the common people received him gladly. He just didn't fit into all of our box of religion of what we thought this day and back in those days. He just didn't fit that mode. And the word became flesh and dwelt among people. It's almost like Jesus jumped in a crowd and did some crowd surfing, right? Yeah. He, was, he was so touchable like that, that it blew everybody's mind because they thought God doesn't do that. God doesn't dress like that. God doesn't talk like that. He don't hang around sinners. So he blew their whole religious mind. Yeah. But when he started doing things like that, the Bible said, because God was with him. He was doing good and healing people. I love that about him. He was touched with every infirmity yet without sin. Ooh. So he walked the earth for 33 years, healing people, casting out demons, cleansing the lepers, preaching and teaching, talking to people, going to parties, going to weddings. He did all that for 33 years. But for what? I mean, it's good, but why? Well, it goes back to what Adam did. Everybody is still under this condemnation because Adam was the God of this world but now when Satan deceived him Satan now becomes the God of this world according to Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 and he's over the prince of the palace of the air the second heaven right so you got this first heaven what we see the second heaven is where the demonic forces are at and then the third heaven is where God resides but my people are destroyed. We think what we see is what it is. When there are spiritual forces in wicked pla in high places, according to Ephesians chapter four, and then chapter six, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers of this ruler of this of this age. That's why I put on the full armor of God. We were just flowing. That's all it was. So watch this. So Jesus, I'm trying to set it up the way you walk and see it. Jesus walked for 33 years had disciples, and he basically said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But my purpose, like our sister was saying, I know I gotta go to the cross. But I'm gonna live like this for 33 years just to give you a little taste test of how life's supposed to be. But I'm out of here. When God created the earth in seven days, the Bible said he sat down. Jesus says, spoken as the word that, that, that was made flesh, I'm gonna do my job and then I'm about to sit down. Same thing. 
So I'm about to do something for you all. The reason why God in the flesh came down, I need to give you all something because you left something at the fall of Adam. Even though you wasn't born yet, you still left something. Your inheritance. The inheritance of the saints is you're supposed to condemn this thing. The inheritance of the saints is you're supposed to have power. So you left it when Adam sinned. So I come and I'm going to give you this life. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of God. Then he says, whatever. Everybody say whatever. whatever. Say it again, whatever. whatever. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. This is your inheritance. I will come and I'm going to restore back the keys. This is your inheritance. Y'all hearing this? So he got this big key in his hand and he says, you can't get this key unless you come through me. You got to get it from my hand. You can't get it from Buddha's hand. You can't get it from Islam hand. You can't get it from these spiritualist people that say you can get to God any kind of way. No, there's only one key and it comes from my hand. Why does it come from his hand? He says, I will do this. So in other words, even though Jesus walked the earth, he had fulfilled everything yet until he said it is finished. Now we see all of this connecting. I'm, I'm, we're all, he, Jesus like, we're almost there. I'm going to give you this key. And once I give you this key, it's finished. I'm going to go right back to where I came from. The rest is on y'all. I gave you everything you need to do to win. All you have to do is just come through me. Because your name is not good enough anymore, Adam. Your name is not good enough anymore with the laws and the prophets. You keep on dropping it. But if you come through my name, if you come through, he said, I am the door. I am the truth. I am the light. If you come through me, you will have the eternal life. But if you come any other way, you're a thief and a robber. This is the gospel. So watch this. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. He says, I am the living one. I was dead. And now look. Everybody say look. He says, now look, I am alive forevermore uh, and forever. And I hold the keys of death and hell or the region of the dead or shoal. I, I have the keys. Now I have, to, I have to say this now, the region of shoal, I get a lot of question, questions about that. What in the world is that? Well, before Jesus, I'm just, can, can, I, can I take about five minutes real quick? Just to kind of, okay. Adam, God made Adam to be the God of this world. He messed up, right? We all know the story. Nothing happened when Eve ate the fruit because God didn't tell her. But the moment he ate the fruit, all hell broke loose because he was the God of this world. All right. So all he had to do was just eat it. She would have ate it. He could have looked at her and said, OK, it's fine. It's not fine, but don't eat that anymore. But as long as he didn't eat it, because he was the one that God gave that instruction to. All right. So because it came through in the hands of his wife, I get it. If your wife gives you something, you trust her. So you won't eat it. So now all of us are in this mess. Right. So now when you die, Originally, you're supposed to just go to heaven, but you can't go to heaven because you're in a sin state and no sin can stand in God's presence. So what God do to all these people before Jesus showed up when they died, they went to the region of Sheol or the paradise, but it was hell, but not the hell that we see hell. It's like, and I'm gonna prove it to you, it's two forms of hell. One was a paradise and one was a place of torment. The one with the place of torment has flames. The one with the place of torment is the everlasting punishment. But there was a place for the dead to go. People like Abraham, Isaac, and David, and Moses, and all these people, they went to the place of Sheol, the place of the dead. Because they couldn't go to heaven yet because there was nobody to redeem anybody. So they were in a waiting place. Are y'all getting this? Y'all are getting this, ain't you? I can feel faith in the room. So listen, they went to the place of Sheol to be held until the Lamb of God came to take the sin from the world. But they wasn't in torment. They were just there in the place of the dead. How you prove that? Remember when Jesus was on the cross hanging and one, 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 um, one thief said, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross and save us too. And the other one said, you fool. This guy is not doing anything. We deserve ours. And then he looked at him and he said, Master, when you go into your kingdom, remember me. Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Right? Paradise. Why? Because Jesus' plan was, I got to go all the way down. Let's just read it. 
let's just read it Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 verse 10 therefore he says he when he ascended on high he led captives uh, captivity captive who are the captivity people all the people that were in the place of the dead the region of Sheol watch this he gave them gifts to men verse 9 skip down a little bit now this he now this he ascended what does that mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth that's another way of saying he went all the way down to get the captives and he got all of them and took them to heaven so you remember that story with the rich man and Lazarus? The Bible says when the rich man died, he was buried and then in, and in hell and in flames, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Lazarus afar off. That verse continues to say that he was in paradise, but between you and us, there's this gap. There's this, uh, this, this gorge, there's this cavern that you, you can't cross. In other words, they said in this, Abraham said in this place, there's a gap in this place there's a gap so that nobody on your side can come to our side nobody on our side can come to your side but it was one place y'all getting this so when jesus came he came to the earth and then he did everything to show us 33 years but then he said oh moses and david and elijah and all these prophets in the old testament i'm going down 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 wow. get them and take them to my place, I'm preparing a place for you. Where I am, you will be with me also. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. I'm taking you to heaven. Here's your mansion, Moses. Here's your mansion. Here's your mansion. It's better than paradise, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, because I prepared a place for you. You couldn't get it first until I've done what I've done. Y'all seeing this? So when he went down and got, got the captives, it's like Satan went down to the pits of hell to get the keys of death. That's where the keys were at. Because when, when Adam gave his authority to Satan, he actually gave his keys over to Satan. And so the keys are down in, in, with death and, and Jesus came because he was a spotless lamb and hell couldn't hold him, he took the keys. And they couldn't do anything about it. He just walked right up to it, grabbed the keys and said, what? And they, <laughs> And then he, he grabbed everybody who was in captive, follow me, and they all followed him to heaven. So that's what we say, thank you, Jesus. Because if it wasn't for you, we'd all be here. Now, granted, they wasn't being tormented, but they were in the place of the dead. Now, we don't go to that place of the dead. We rest, and the Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I hope y'all got that. So... The keys right he got the keys and he just said in that verse right there I will give you the keys to the kingdom now he said that before he got crucified I'm going to give you the keys so he got crucified he he, he died got the people from from the region of Sheol took them to earth then he came back the third day right this is what we celebrate right came back the third day and he said what all power and Jesus came and said to him, all power and authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world or the end of the age. Amen. He's basically said that if you say it now in my name, you're going to get it right. Because you've been trying to make disciples and do all of this on your own and all of y'all keep missing it. But if you do it again with my name, you already in. So you can teach them the same way they try to teach with the law and the prophets. But now you do it in the name of Jesus. All that authority. He said all the power and authority has been given to me. That name. Not your name, but his name. So now, and then he says, and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven if you do it in my name. See, before they were just doing it because there was a man of God or a woman of God. But now you come in through the name of Jesus. And when you say it now in his name, all you have to do is just stand on the name. And he made it easy for everybody. At first, everybody was stumbling at this thing. But when Jesus came in, he says, all you got to do is just do it in my name. You're healed in the name of Jesus. You're delivered in the name of Jesus. You're set free in the name of Jesus. So you don't have to just say, God, 
come and move this mountain. God, come do this for me. No, in the name of Jesus, you, come, you speak to that mountain in the name of Jesus. So what is it that you don't like in your life? The weapon that is formed against you. You use the name of Jesus to speak to that. And then you command whatever is being held up to come forward. Right? The promises of God are what? Yes and amen. There's in the word of God. All you have to do is just stand on the word, which is, the, which is Jesus. The word became flesh. And regardless of what it looks like, I stand on this word because the word is the incorruptible seed. Are you listening to me? So now I say it in the name of Jesus, regardless of what it looked like, because it's going to look crazy. When you start standing on the word and you start saying all this because God, the Lord has given you the keys. That's just like somebody. I mean, can you imagine how, how insane that would be if you go through the closing process of your house and they give you the keys and you walk up to the house, to the front door and you're calling the realtor. Can y'all let me in? You got the keys in your hand. But that's how a lot of people do. They, they want God to come and do everything for them when he says, no, no, no. I gave you the keys. Why don't you just use your key and unlock the door? John chapter 20, verse 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be unto you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Verse 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The part of God inside of you that makes you godly. Verse 23, if you forgive anyone's sins, they, their sins are forgiven. See, we don't talk about that a lot because we get into a little hot water. But that's what he said. If you forgive someone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, then they are not forgiven. I need to fix this light. Don't worry about it. So here's my point. He said, I, I've done all of this just to give you back the keys. Yes, you go to God the Father and you pray in the name of Jesus, but what are you doing with the key that's in your hand? Are you just settling and letting the devil punch you in the face and you got the keys in your hand? Or are you going to take your authority because Jesus died to give you these keys and some of us are saying, Lord, if you're not too busy, would you please stretch forth your hand? Would you please come see about me? And you are living beneath your privileges. You have overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Why are you settling for just anything that happens? When God has died, the Lord has died to give you these keys. And a lot of us put the key in our back pocket and we don't even use it. We want somebody else to pray for us. We want somebody else to give us the scriptures. We want somebody else to tell us what the Lord is saying when you have the keys. And so you remember when Jesus ascended and they was all looking up and they were like, man. And then the angels showed up. Show that picture again. The angels showed up and said, you see this Jesus that just went up there? The same way you saw him go up, he's going to come down. But he, he came down here just for you all. Just to show you how to live this Christian life. So you have all of these principalities. You have all these weapons that's formed against you. And you as the believer, you can use your authority to command them to leave. But you know how it looks like in the spirit? You have this promise from God. You have this plan of God for your life. Let's just say it's a house, car, spouse, whatever it is you believe in God for. And you know the promises of God are yes and amen, but they're in the realm of the faith spirit, faith area. But because Satan is still the God of this world, even though he's not God over you, he's the God of this world. He has like this hindering spirits and all these distracting spirits that stop you from the prayer that God has for you. So a lot of people's faith or their prayer looks like this. So here's your prayer at the top. Forgive my illustration. Here's your prayer. All your answered prayers are up in the spirit realm. God's healing, God's plan for your life, God's deliverance. But you got all these demonic distracting things that's punching and kicking your, your particular promise from God, right? And they're all in the way. Here you are, you're trying to worship, but you got all of these spirits and the key is right there. He's given you the key. And so what we try to do, we try to just say, okay, let me just see if I can get past these demons and get my prayer. For it. it ain't gonna work that way. What you need to do is use your authority and bind those spirits. When you recognize a certain spirit, show that again, because I want people to see this. When you recognize a certain spirit is in between you and your promise, 
then whenever you recognize that spirit, you take authority over that spirit. Stop waiting for somebody to come in and wait for something to change. No, you use your key and you speak to that mountain. This is your inheritance. Everything that rises against you, you shall condemn it. So why aren't we condemning things? I'm talking about even if it's not coming to our front door, when you see it on the news and you see that spirit, condemn it. Right there, because what happens is the, these spirits, since nobody's taking authority over them, they're just running roughshod all over everything because the believers are not using their authority that Jesus died to give them the keys to do. When Jesus sat down, he sat down on the right hand of the Father. When God got done um, making the earth and all the cycles and everything, God sat down, he rested, he's still resting. Guess who all the authority is on? Us, but we have help, we have the Holy Spirit. So we have God in us, living in us, so when we see these spirits distracting us from our healing, distracting us from our deliverance, distracting us from these answered prayers. No, I'm not gonna to try to push past them and say, no, that's my house, get out the way y'all demons. No, I'm gonna look at that demon and I'm gonna address that demon according to the word of God and command that demon to leave. And then by faith, tell it, come forth. I don't have to do a lot of work. God made it too easy for us. I feel faith in the room. Y'all got faith. And what happens is we pray wrong and God is not obligated to send that prayer because you have been using your authority. You have not used your keys. Therefore, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. That's why it says, thank God, you got to have preachers that preach this. But if we're too busy just talking about, okay, yeah, Jesus died. That's great. But what did he die for? To give us something. But are we using what he has given us? Or are we waiting for the next prophet to come to town so they can wave their hand over us? No, you have authority. You have the authority that Jesus died to give you this believer's authority and the key is in your back pocket. Why are you, and again, I know you need, we, we need the Lord and we need Jesus of course and we need the Holy Spirit, but don't fight these battles on your own. Nothing wrong with people that agree with you in prayer and in intercessory and prophesying, but you have the keys. Whatever spirit you see, don't you be going and calling the person a spirit either. <laughs> you devil, don't call him a devil. No, it's a spirit in the person that you address. And you know what? You don't have to holler at it either. I know we've been taught that. But if your faith is in hollering, then holler if your faith is there. But if your faith is in the gentle, still, small voice and you can just speak to it and have the same amount of faith, then speak to it. You ain't got to holler because God ain't scared of you and he ain't deaf. You ain't got to. I mean, we learned this like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. You got like, God, dog, oh, come on. Just say what you got to say. But we, we use this religious way because we thought that's how you get God's attention. You hollering and screaming and sweating and punching things. No, use your key and just open the door and walk in. Yes. All you got to do. So Jesus didn't make you out to, to fight the battles in a way. You put on the full armor of God so you can stand in the evil day. But you don't really have to do a whole lot of fighting like they did in the Old Testament because Jesus had done that for you. You receive what he did by faith. And you just actually just do what he calls you to do. Use your key. I see that spirit that's trying to uh, stop me with lack when it comes to my finances. I rebuke that lack spirit in the name of Jesus. And then you say, prosperity or whatever, I command you to come forward. Don't you be like, I rebuke you, devil. Are you, are you gonna go? Are you gonna go? No, you ain't got no faith. But if you can believe those things that you say, it shall be done for you in the name of Jesus, not in your name. So put that up again, sir. I want y'all to see this. You got all these forces that stop in your prayers and some of them are just, just a distraction. They're not even kicking the prayer. They're just actually just jumping in your way and they're intimidating you. And the believer is like, Lord, send it, send it. No, you need to rebuke those spirits and then command it to just come forth because you have the key, the key is on your side. It's not in anybody else. Satan don't have the keys. He just, he just bet that you don't recognize who you are in Christ. That's, right. That's all he's doing. Thank you, sir. So 
I guess this is my teaching. The key of the kingdom. And if you can use, if you can ever recognize that Jesus didn't just die on the cross so you can go to heaven. No, he died to give you authority on the earth in the land of the living. David said, I would have fainted if I did not see the goodness of the, of the Lord in the land of the living. So if it was just God's design for you to just get born again, uh, you know, get born again, you might as well, once you get saved, somebody ought to come to you and kill you then, if that's the case. Because he didn't want you to just go to heaven once you get born again, because you know you're going to mess it up. So that's why you need to walk with the Lord. But he also want to give you the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You're supposed to live the abundant life. You're not supposed to try to force your way to get abundant life. No, you're supposed to. This is your inheritance. Are y'all getting this? This is your inheritance. When they give you the keys to the house, when they give the keys to our house, they inherit the keys to us. That's the term they use. So it's an inheritance. That means whatever I bind on earth, whatever I bind on earth is bound in heaven. If it goes against God's word, then I don't have to get punched in the face by the devil. I can speak to that devil and I can tread upon every serpent and scorpions and all the power of the enemy because Jesus died to give me these keys. And I'm going to use these keys. I don't want by anybody else, but I'm about to use my keys. You can stay outside if you want to. It's cold outside, but I'm about to open this door and walk right in. So he didn't just die on the cross just to get the captives that was down there living to go to heaven. No, he died so that you could have the abundant life. And he says, these are your keys. So bind every spirit that goes against what you see in your, in your spirit. Every single one of them. I don't care if you got to do it every day. You, do, you bind it until, that, until the faith rises up in you. Because sometimes you got to build your faith to bind that spirit because it's been around for so long, for years, and you got to work your faith up and say, no, I defeated a lion and a bear. This uncircumcised Philistine is nothing for me. And you have to build your faith up and then speak to that mountain and command it to move. And you ain't got to wrestle with the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood as far as like this and he's fighting me and always oh, on the ropes and uh, in round three, I'm going to get you this. No, it's a wrestle because sometimes he comes back with those same thoughts like, oh, it didn't work. That's the wrestling. And he said, no, it did work. By faith, I believe that when I speak to you and I bind you, I don't care how many times you come in my mind. I command that spirit to come out of my mind. Command that spirit to come out of my eyes, out of my hands, out of my mouth, out of my fingertips, out of my toes. You command this. Somebody said, that's weird. Well, you know what? If you see something that's going against the word of God and God gives you a green light and show you this is where it's at, then speak to that spirit. Stop speaking to the situation. I mean, I understand he's using the situation, but it's not the situation. That's a distraction. It's the spirit behind the situation. So the person is not your enemy. The job is not your enemy. This cultural group is not your enemy. It's the spirit behind it. Use your key and bind it and just command the promises of God to come forward in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's all I got. Oh, thank you, Lord. That's a refreshing when you hear the gospel. It even helps me. I'm up here preaching and I'm like, Lord, this is good. I'm up here taking notes on my own stuff. <laughs> my point is, he didn't just die. What does this shirt say, baby girl? You bought me this shirt. I was one way and now I'm completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. The thing that happened in between was him. It wasn't that I did something great. I was one way. But when Jesus came, it totally changed the way I see things. It changed the way I pray. It changed the way I look at things. I'm not going to just wrestle because it looks bad. I'm a different person because the Holy Spirit lives in me. And I can do just like Jesus and walk around and have faith with God and man. Because the Lord is with me. This is why he died on the cross and we celebrate Resurrection Day. You have the keys again. Adam lost them. But guess what? It's restored. Thank you, Jesus. That's the proper way to say it. Thank you, Jesus. 
I don't have to live like everybody else who have no hope. That's why the world, they think we're crazy, but we got the keys. They're outside in the cold talking about, no, this is the way it's supposed to be. You can stay with them if you want to. I got the keys and I'm entering in, not through the gate or through the window like a thief and a robber. I'm going in through the door. That's why Islam can't save you. That's why all these spiritualist Christians that add all of these things, because none of them have conquered death, hell, and the grave. None of them grab the keys. They all sit up there wishing they had the keys. Jesus grabbed the keys. He's the real deal Holyfield. I know that, that put me in the age bracket, but that's the real deal Holyfield. My point is this. You cannot expect to get to God the Father and have the purpose life that you're supposed to have without Jesus. And there's a lot of people that are out here now and they're, they, they got doctrines of devils. I'm gonna tell you, it's a doctrine of devil. You got Christian people who are meditating with another God. They're doing all kinds of spiritualist yoga stuff. And they think their faith is stronger when they mix Jesus with other things. That is not the will of God for your life. He said, be ye separate, come out among them. And so you have to, you have to walk like Jesus walked. Anything that says you use Jesus plus something else, that is a doctrine of devils. And as you see, as we go through this culture, you're going to see more of that. People who look like you, people who don't look like you, it's going to be a trend of doctrine of devils because now they're closing down the churches and some of the churches, they're afraid to open up again. But you got all of these people and a lot of people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge and they start, they're gravitating. They're gravitating to other things. But if you can just recognize the keys that God has given you, you're going to walk in things that other people sink in. You will be able to walk on the water because you keep your eyes on Jesus. Everybody else will drown. So you have to stick and stay with the cross. Because the only way you're going to really be changed is through the renewing of your mind, through the word of God, and the Holy Spirit has to live and dwell in you. This is the gospel. This is why we celebrate today. He didn't just rise. He restored. He restored everything. I think I'm done. I think I'm done. I don't have anything else. Lord, I thank you for this teaching. I believe by faith it's going to go exactly to the right people who are struggling with their faith. There are some people even now that's listening to me who has been trying to dabble in other things because they don't think God is enough. They don't think Jesus is enough. So they want to lean to their own understanding. We rebuke that spirit of confusion right now in the name of Jesus that's over their minds. The God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they will not hear the gospel. There are unsaved loved ones that are blinded by the world. We speak to that deceptive spirit that's blinding them right now and we command it to let go of our loved ones in the name of Jesus. Then we cause our loved ones to come forth in the name of Jesus and walk in their godly inheritance in the name of Jesus, not by our name, but in the name of Jesus. So we will use our authority. We will use the keys and we will not be uh, defeated by what we see. We are not moved by what we see. We are moved by what we believe. So in the name of Jesus, Lord, let your people wake up. Let them see the keys that you have died to give them. And in the name of Jesus, let us walk in the authority that you have given us. And not just passively get by. You have died to give us the keys of the kingdom. So we bind every spirit that, that is not like God, that's not like the word that goes contrary to what you have spoken to us. We command it to go now in the name of Jesus. And we call our promises to come forward. And we will stand in faith, no matter how long it takes, we will stand in faith until we fully receive everything that you've promised us in the land of the living. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you receive that? Thank you for listening to Upon the Rock broadcast. If you enjoyed this message, please visit the church website at thefoundedworld.org for a free download. Also, please be sure to share this message with your family and friends on social media sites to help spread the word of God. Have a great week.